Okay, I think we're ready to do this. Uh, I hope that you can hear me. I hope that you've got captions available. I hope that you can hear the music in the background. I think all of that should be in place. Do let me know if something's not working. Um, <laughs> welcome everybody to Archival Adventures. Uh, let me say hello. Uh, hello, Lord Portico. Uh, thank you for trying to work out a finding aid command. That is an excellent idea, and I am definitely going to have to like add that to my prep list for things to do every week so that it's just a command. And I don't have to worry about looking it up in the room here and being prepared to copy and paste. Amazing. Um, hi, Hannah. Hi, Key Squared. Um, hi, Fluid Anne. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Um, I, I'm trying some new headphones today and they are weirding me out. Uh, they're, not, they're not open back, so I sound really strange to myself. If that gets too much for me, I will find the other ones. They're in this room somewhere. Um, also, if you get a little bit of wind noise, it's still ridiculously hot in this room. So I brought my fan from my desk downstairs and it is currently blowing on me. Um, and yeah, it's supposed to be like 75 degrees outside today and it feels like the heat is on in here. So, um, <laughs> so that's where we are with that. Um, and in fact, give me just, just one second. I'm not even going to go to the Be Right Back screen. I'm just going to step away for one second and see if I can find those other headphones because this isn't really working for me. I have found them. I just have to wander around a lot of equipment to get them. Bear with me. One second. <laughs> this is what doing it live looks like, y'all. I don't know what's going on. Wow. OK. <laughs> as beat up as this pair is, they're open back, and it makes for a much better experience for me. So. Doo, doo, doo. <laughs> Mysterious talking building. Hold, please. Hum the girl from Ipanema to yourselves. Well, <laughs> well, I take care of the final bit of this. Doo -doo. Oh, wow, now you're getting... I'm just causing problems. All right. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me during that. Because um, it, it surprisingly makes a huge difference for me uh, to be able to have the open back on the headphones and be able to hear the sounds in the room. Um, anyway, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining me for Archival Adventures today. Um, today we are lo looking at the Joshua Gilman Hawks papers. Um, and we'll talk about who Joshua Gilman Hawks was uh, in just a second. First, I'm going to do uh, the land and labor acknowledgement like I do at the beginning of every one of these. Uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. 
We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tutelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through Inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Ut Prosim, that I may serve, in the spirit of community diversity and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. And I just realized, I can't hear the music. Can you all hear the music? I hope that you can. Oh, I know what's wrong. All sorts of things. These headphones are much quieter than the other ones. That's what's the, the, the difference. I think you all can still hear it. Regardless, we're gonna move forward and actually look at the stuff. So let me go ahead and make sure that the finding aid is available for everyone to look at and we'll talk about what this collection is. Um, thank you Portico for dropping the finding aid in the chat over on the Rogan 27 channel uh, and I just dropped it into the chat on the, um, the library's uh, VT Well Studios channel. So Joshua Gilman Hawks, who was he? Why do we have his papers? Um, so there's a biographical note in the finding aid. Um, Joshua Gilman Hawks was the son of Joshua and Abigail Bancroft Hawks. He was born in Linfield, Massachusetts on August 18, 1831. <clears throat> uh, after serving as an apprentice manufacturer of sash stores and blinds, Hawks attended school in Vermont. He graduated from Amherst College in 1859 and became principal of Conway Academy in Conway, Massachusetts. Hawks left Conway in late 1861, returning to Linfield, where he resumed his studies and also took private lessons in military tactics. He enlisted in Company D of the 52nd Massachusetts Infantry for, the nine -month, for a nine-month term of service on September 8, 1862. Eventually attaining the rank of sergeant, Hawks participated in the occupation of Baton Rouge and the siege of Port Hudson. On the night of July 23, 1863, his regiment's term of service having expired, Hawks was among those who boarded the steamer uh, Henri, Ch Henri Choteau, bound for Cairo, Illinois, uh, from which the 52nd would depart for Massachusetts. Um, Hawks, ill with dysentery, was expected after his recovery to accept an officer's commission in United States Colored Troops Regiment. During the first night on the river, however, Hawks disappeared and was assumed to have drowned. Uh, so the collection that we have is a number of letters from him. Um, he was a sergeant in Company D of the 52nd Massachusetts in, um, uh, during the American Civil War. Uh, and so according to this, the letters start with him writing from Camp Miller in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Um, describes camp life, discusses personal acquaintances, uh, mentions the Emancipation Proclamation, which was apparently interesting enough to stick in the finding aid. Um, yeah, so we've got uh, a variety of letters from him uh, writing home from out on the uh, on maneuvers or in, uh, whatnot during the American Civil War, and. Um, yeah, so he was, he was scheduled to become an officer for the, the um, Colored Troops Regiment, which was a regiment that, uh, of the Union Army that mostly had people of color, not just black people, but uh, people of color. So it would have been uh, any Civil War soldiers fighting on the Union side who would have been black but also uh, Asian soldiers, et cetera, uh, uh, et cetera, is such a bad word to use there. Um, uh, just other, other people who would have been considered not white uh, at the time. 
and they would have been in that regiment, but their officers would mostly still have been white. Uh, so he was, he was apparently going to become an officer there, um, was sick with dysentery and vanished, never to be seen again while they were on the boat home. So um, I don't know more than that. The reason we have this collection, which was part of the, the question that I posed early on, um, the reason we have it is that we have significant collections about the American Civil War. Uh, so we have a lot of stuff uh, like this, a lot of letters from soldiers both uh, on both sides of the conflict. Um, this one just caught my eye. Uh, I said last week, I, I was putting in collection numbers just at random. Just wasn't sure what I was gonna uh, look at, didn't know what I wanted to share, and um, our collection numbers have a certain format to them. So I just started typing in numbers at random until something popped up that looked interesting. Uh, and that is how I picked today's collection to share. So hopefully you all are somewhat interested in hearing from this, uh, this soldier from the past. Um, I'm gonna pop us over to the uh, document focus screen so that you'll all be able to see the, the letters as we look at them, because um, we will be looking at the original letters. Um, a lot of these have already been transcribed, and so I have a typed transcription that will help me to, to read them and not struggle with reading them on screen live, which has happened in the past. Yay for me! Uh, <laughs> anyway, how is everybody doing today? It is, um, it is great seeing all of you here. Um, I do appreciate when people join. Uh, all right, so this first folder, box one, folder one, there is only one box, but we still number the boxes. Um, this is Antebellum Papers, 1852 to 1861. Now, me personally, I am not a scholar of the um, American Civil War, uh, of the 1800s, of any of this. Uh, I understand that there is a period of American history that is referred to as the Antebellum Period. I don't actually know what the term means, so I am looking it up in the dictionary. Um, because whoever processed these papers knew enough about it to call them antebellum papers. But I don't know what it means. Um, okay, so the, the dictionary definition, according to Merriam-Webster, which is the first dictionary that popped when I typed the word in, um, it just means existing before a war, especially existing before the American Civil War. Uh, so, yeah, these papers would be his papers from before the American Civil War. And, and there you go, Fluidan and Lord Portico got it. Um, so yeah, let's take a look. I don't think these are transcribed, so yay for me. Um, yeah, I can I can turn down the music just a bit. Let me know if that balance is better, Angela. Um, I hope that it is, but uh, I can't. The balance that I hear in my ears is completely different than what you all hear, so I don't, I don't know. Um, all right, let's see. The first letter that we have. We've got the front here, so this would have been folded. I'm not going to fold it. Uh, 
Oh yeah, don't apologize, Angela. Thank you for letting me know that there was an audio challenge for you and I'm happy to accommodate. Because the music is just there as background. <laughs> um, all right, I'm gonna try. I'm going to try with, this, with, with these letters. Uh, this folder does not have transcriptions in it, so I don't, I don't know how well, how well we'll do. Uh, but I am going to attempt the, um, the reading of this handwriting. I'm just going to zoom in a bit and hit that autofocus. All right, we've got Conway, Massachusetts, May 23rd, 1861. Uh, Mr. J.G. Hawks has been... preceptor of Conway Academy for the last two years. I'm not familiar with this term. Uh, it's possible I'm reading it wrong. I'm going to uh, look up this word as well. Oh, yeah, preceptor, a teacher or instructor. Um, Mr. J.G. Hawks has been preceptor of Conway Academy for the last two years, and his services have given full satisfaction to the matter, or to the master and other, is this? I don't think this is masters. I think this is mothers and other friends of the institution. Tutors? I'm not certain of this word. This word, there are a couple of things it could be given the bumps and, that are available. It's got the T present. Um, I, I don't really see an H after the T, so it wouldn't be mothers. Um, it could be masters and other friends of the institution, but that construction sentence-wise doesn't seem to make sense. Why would you? the masters of an institution would not be friends of the institution, so that doesn't seem to make sense. I'm just not certain what this word is, um, just because there are possibilities and I'm not coming up with it. If I was transcribing it, that's one where I would make my best guess. I would do a little bit of looking, a little bit of analysis of uh, letter shapes and um, give my best guess probably have one or two other people look at it and see if they could tell me, uh, and then I would put it in brackets with a question mark to indicate that it is a guess. Um, <clears throat> he is an able, thorough, and faithful instructor, and we only regret that his limited that the limited resources of our academy do not present inducement sufficient to persuade him to remain with us longer. I think that's George M. Adams, president of, it could be Masters of Conway Academy, but I just, I just don't know what this word is. It could be trustees, Angela. Thank you. Trustees is probably a good bet, because uh, that does look like it's possibly, like a capital T. Um, at the beginning and the last four letters could very easily, or the last five letters could be S-T-E-E-S. -E -E so, thank you. <laughs> this is, like I said, I would take it and, and try to get somebody else to take a look at it because sometimes, like I did not have any real trouble reading even on this, on this second page where the words get very flat. I didn't have trouble reading anything but that one word. Uh, but having somebody else take a look at it, it's, it's easy to figure out what the word is. Um, so there's a note on here 
in different handwriting. Um, it says uh, G.E.O. M. Adams, President, Trustees, Conway Academy, recommending J.G. Hawks. So this would have been, um, uh, as we said, uh, so this would have been a, a letter of recommendation that he received. Because he, he would be the J.G. Hawks in question, um, that they did not have resources sufficient to induce him to remain. <laughs> All right. The next one here has a, a lot of little pinholes in it. I don't know why. Uh, maybe we will find out after we read it. I will also note, um, I don't think it's ever going to be something that's going to show up for you all. Um, trying to find a good representation of it. Uh, here on this page, you might be able to see it, um, there's an embossed seal on every one of these letters. And I think some of the later ones, it looks more like a woman's uh, head in silhouette. Uh, this appears to be a border around the letters G and I. Um, I don't know what that's about. Like, I don't know what the I would be. I, don't, I honestly don't know what the G would be. So I don't know specifically what the embossed symbol is. Um, I just think it's interesting to note that they all have that embossed bit on them. Looking, this has pinholes too. I'm wondering if this was... attached in some way. Received Amherst, September 29th, 1860, um, uh, of Joshua G. Hawks. I'm not sure. L I. X, I, I, I'm not certain the last letter here. Dollars, 42 cents, six. Six dollars, 42 cents as, um, as something, it starts with a P. PR or something on Notary of Life. Uh, Notary of Life Insurance number 3886 from October 1st, 1862. Uh, October 1st, 1861, name of the agent, have the receipt attached to your notary. So it's, um, a receipt for payment of a life insurance policy, it looks like. Received October 2nd, 1862 of Mr. Joshua G. Hawks, uh, $6.42 
for the life insurance. So I'm guessing that the pinholes were how they were attaching the money. Possibly, I don't know. Interesting, it, it, the pinholes are a question for me. Um, I'm sure somebody who's an actual scholar of, of Civil War history may have seen that before. This is, uh, if you've watched for a while, you know this is not my period. Um, the period of time that most of my um, archival work has been focused on is like the late 1970s on, um, because most of my archival work has been related to um, historically marginalized populations, so looking at um, a lot of civil rights era stuff, LGBTQ rights uh, movement, things like that. Uh, so this is like a hundred years before the time period that I'm most familiar with. Uh, so there's a lot of things that I'm just not familiar with. Um, another life insurance. <clears throat> so this one, um, I don't know, it's probably been at least a year since I talked about the plastic lips. So metal paper clips, while they are very good and extremely convenient to use, will rust over time. Um, and that rust will damage the papers. So one of the steps in processing a collection is to remove things like metal staples or metal paper clips, and we here replace them with plastic clips, uh, which is just plastic paper clips. Um, these also damage the paper over time by bending it, um, but any paper clip will do that. Um, and these are better than the metal ones. Uh, so that's why we go with these. Um, not. 100% of our stuff gets that level of processing, depending on the size of the collection, how uh, important it is. Um, it just a, a lot of factors go into whether we go to the level of removing all of the staples and removing all of the paper clips and replacing them with plastic clips. Completely different uh, like from collection to collection, uh, just based on amount of backlog and amount of staffing time that we have available. Um, you're reminded of Eric Kastner's 1920 novel, Email and the Detectives, where an important clue was the pinholes through the currency from where it had been pinned inside someone's jacket for safekeeping. Oh, key squared. Uh, I didn't see that a spoiler should have been warned before I read it. So sorry if anybody uh, just had Eric Kastner's 1921 novel, Email and the, or Emil and the Detectives uh, spoiled. I just realized it was not email. Uh, since it was a 1920s novel. Um. <laughs> uh, so we have a little envelope here. Um, the writing on here is J.G. Hawks Esquire, Linfield, Massachusetts, written after leaving his poem delivered at South Linfield, 1861 written, sorry, after hearing his poem. I wonder, I wonder what the poem was. Um, and here we have the Piedmont and Bolton Telegraph Company embossed on this uh, envelope, addressed to Joshua G. Hawks, Conway, Massachusetts. Uh, someone has written on here in pencil, September 1859. Puts book back on Barnes and Noble shelf. <laughs> um. Oh, I love this. Really, um, there's a little sarcasm in the voice there. This this letter is gorgeous. The handwriting on it is gorgeous. It's also super thin lines, which just makes it a little bit harder to read. So I'm gonna try and zoom in a little bit for you all, and then I'm probably gonna be leaning forward and squinting because really, really thin brown lines on this page 
Uh, all right, we have <clears throat> Linfield, February 14th. An impromptu. Please, Mr. Hawks, if you are not too proud. Uh, heed the congratulations of the crowd. Not certain of this word. Um, mid. It's mid. It's apostrophe M-I-D, so meaning amid. Gotcha. Please, Mr. Hawks, if you are not too proud, mid the congratulations of the crowd, to listen to an old-time schoolmate's voice, send ear to mine and hear how I rejoice that much as I had idly dared to dream might be well spoken on your chosen theme. Much as I hoped from one whose brain and will had owned the guiding power of D.G. Gill, possibly D.G. Hill, uh, I had not hoped nor dreamed that each sweet string on the great harp of poetry could sing with such unmeasured sweetness, strength, and power as chained our senses through that one brief hour. The almost breathless silence of the place, the rapt attention of each unruptured face, or sorry, ah! oh, that's very different. The rapt attention of each upturned face uh, were, higher, uh, were higher tributes to your art and lore than thundering plaudit or the wild encore. And Ian, our and in our Willem teacher might be proud to see you swaying thus the eager crowd. To know that guided by your white right hand, the mighty pen becomes a magic wand. One only fault your classic poem bore, it closed too soon and made me wish for more, or made us wish for more. Yes, made me wish that I might tell you then how thrice delighted had your audience been. But we were strangers, and I dared not break the formal laws which pride and fashion make, and so I give today each faulty line into the care of good St. Valentine. There is no, no information on here as to who wrote this poem. Um, and it seems rather well written. I'm, uh, I think preference, my preference would be this, this odd line here of uh, to know that guided by your white right hand, uh, it is the mid 1800s, but but yeah, overall, uh, there was a word here, um, and Ian, our Willem teacher, might be proud. I'm not, I don't know Willem. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be using the dictionary quite a bit today. Uh, w, H I L, O M. <laughs> the dictionary says it is archaic. It is an adverb, formerly co uh, semicolon in the past. Uh, as an adjective, it means former or erstwhile. So it seems like from that sentence, and Ian, our erstwhile teacher, might be proud, um, 
it seems like possibly this poem was written by somebody who was a former classmate of Joshua, um, who had gone and seen him speak, or seen him apparently deliver a poem. Interesting. I, I did not know that there was poetry in this collection like this. Um, and while I did have to lean close to be able to read it um, because of the faintness of the, uh, the ink on the page, um, not actually terribly difficult to read this handwriting. Uh, we're lucking out with regard to that in, in this uh, folder. Let's see, the next one that we have. And if anybody has comments or questions, feel free to, to let me know. I don't know that I will have answers, but I'm happy to explore and discuss. Uh, this certifies that Joshua G. Hawks, a member of the senior class in Amherst College, is a young man of good character and scholarship, and to the best of my knowledge and belief is and T-I I think it me like I'm not certain I think it might be entirely but it seems too short for that um, but it definitely starts E N T I the next word is uh, worthy of the confidence of the committee and expecting of committees seeking teachers for schools. W.A. Stearns or Steers, something like that, Amherst. Uh, 7 October 1858. It's a letter of recommendation uh, from the college professor. That one word stumped me uh, just because it looks too short to be entirely, but entirely seems to be the word that would fit there. So again, if I was transcribing it, I would probably in this case type entirely, but put it in brackets with a question mark to indicate that I that's a guess. I'm not 100% certain. Hello, Wussy Delta. Welcome in. <clears throat> Let's see. So we have one here from Thetford Academy. March 1856. It gives me pleasure hereby to certify that Mr. J.G. Hawks, now a member of Amherst College, was for several terms a member of our school and that we regarded him as a gentleman of good character and scholarship and one that would be likely to succeed in teaching. G.E. Hood, Principal. I love the variety of paper that, that we get uh, going back to some of these older documents. Um, so everything we've had so far has been on basic, like plain or like cream colored. It's cream colored today. I don't know how white it was in the past, but it's kind of all been this same um, paper. It's got a little bit of a texture to it. Um, they've all, Letters at that time were getting embossed. This one has a shield as the embossing on it. 
I can try and autofocus that so you can see it better. Um, and I don't know if you can see the lines. Uh, there are lines that in your image would be vertical lines um, that are just kind of the way, the result of the construction of the paper. Um, we had one earlier that had, um, that was ruled on one side of it. Uh, so ruled paper being paper that's not just plain but has printed lines on it. Um, so one of the bits that had the pinpricks in it had, had ruled lines on it. Uh, love history so much. Should have gone to college for history, but you've been in the military for four years now. Um, Wussy Delta, there's always time to study history. Uh, so, welcome in um, today's collection that we are looking at. Oh, hang on one second. You're going to see my arm a little bit because I got to reach. Um, I don't know what just. Somehow my uh, my windows got a little messed up, and uh, it's fine. It just confused me for a second. Um, if you want to know a little bit about the collection we're looking at, the finding aid is there. It'll give you a description of um, the person whose papers these were and a little of his history. These papers are from uh, a Union soldier in, um, during the American Civil War. Um, right now we're looking at antebellum papers. This folder is all letters from before uh, the war started um, when he was a teacher. Um, and later on, we'll get to some of the letters that he wrote home during the war. Um, but yeah, that's the collection that we're looking at today. You study history, but not for college. It's your passion. Yeah. Um, and we do, have, uh, we do have some World War I and World War II materials. Um, yes, these are all original. Um, uh, so this is the archives here at Virginia Tech. Uh, and we have, a, we have a rather extensive collection of Civil War uh, American Civil War material, um, uh, letters from soldiers on both the Union and the Confederate sides, um, as well as um, uh, like journals from women on the home front, stuff like that. It's one of our major collecting areas. Um, we do have some additional material that are um, uh, that are World War One, World War Two, Vietnam, Korea. Um, I'm not certain exactly how much we have related to um, like the Gulf War or Afghanistan. Um, probably some, but I, I haven't gone specifically to look. Um, but a lot of the stuff that we have related to the other wars has to do with um, Medal of Honor winners that attended Virginia Tech. Uh, so there's a Virginia Tech connection that's the reason we have those materials. Uh, whereas we specifically have a collection or a collecting focus to gather materials about the American Civil War. So we, that's why we have a lot of Civil War stuff. So let's see. Um, a description of a Virginia Christmas. My dearest G, last Christmas... Uh, Last Christmas morn, ere I had quit my bed, a, a little black person came to me. A Christmas gift, she said. A little present give to me. Okay, before I go further, just going to disclaimer. Um, these are historic documents. Um, and as, I, as has happened before and will happen again, we are going to encounter terms that would not be in... Um, common usage today that would be considered derogatory that are terms that you should not use. Um, I do my best when I'm reading uh, to go ahead and substitute uh, acceptable terminology that we use in common usage today uh, where necessary. Um, but on your screen, if you're reading along, you'll probably see the words. And so just noting these are historic documents. They are the originals unedited in any way, um, and sometimes the things we encounter might be difficult for people. If it becomes difficult for you, make sure you take care of yourself. Um, you can always come back and watch the VOD later, or if you just need to step away for a minute and come back, we'll likely have moved on to a different document by the time you get back. 
<laughs> yeah, we see Delta. I'm, yeah, there's no reason for me to. Uh, you all can see it on the screen. Um, and so I, I try to make sure that it's a safe place for people to come and, and kind of learn about history. And I'm not going to pretend that it's not there. I'm just going to, for my narration, change what the word is. Um, and, you know, sometimes we have gotten to some content that uh, has just been too much, a little too graphic in description of things. Um, and in that case, we've set it aside and moved on to other things. Uh, because I d the, the audience is broad here and uh, we have plenty of material to look at. If people want to find um, those things and come back and look at them later, we have options for people to be able to access them through the archives. <laughs> um, different languages are definitely a challenge, we see. Uh, the, um, and honestly, the, the writer, the handwriting of specific people, sometimes it is easy to read, sometimes it is very hard to read. For some reason, um, the letters that we've looked at so far today have been really easy for me. Uh, even when they barely have any bumps in the words, they're almost flat lines, I, I've been doing really well. Um, when you throw in another language on top of it being cursive and it being archaic cursive, so not the way we would form the letters today, as you can see these are slanted, uh, whereas if somebody was writing in cursive today, it would be much more likely that the letters would be straight up and down or even slanted the opposite direction from the way that they are here. Um, and these are actually not bad. Uh, sometimes in the mid-1800s and before, you get uh, even more pronounced slant on the letters. And all of that can contribute to making it hard to read the text. Um, so sometimes we'll have one person work with a letter and they just cannot make out the words. This person's handwriting is just incomprehensible to one person and we give it to somebody else to transcribe and they read it no problem. Um, it, it's just sometimes it clicks and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, sometimes as with earlier um, <clears throat> you're doing great with it and you'll come across one word. Uh, we had a letter that had the word trustees in it. I could not figure out what that word was um, but uh, Angela in chat suggested, oh, it might be trustees. And as soon as it was pointed out to me that that's what it could be, it made perfect sense and, and clicked. But otherwise, until it, somebody else looked at it, I wasn't getting that word. So you got this original set of postcards from a World War I German soldier with, from three different years during the war. Even trying to translate it, yeah. Um, Honestly, your best bet is probably to find somebody who reads German uh, or is a native German speaker. Like, you might have German reading ability, but when you add in um, cursive, and specifically German cursive, uh, there, uh, some of the letter forms are very particular to German cursive, uh, German historic cursive. Um, so it might be helpful to get a native German speaker uh, who was educated by the German education system to assist in trying to make out what the words are. Um, the other way to approach it would be to go letter by letter. Find letters that you can identify and, and, and break it up as though you're code breaking. Um, and, and take each letter form and compare it to others and you've got some examples of letters that you know and some examples of, of questionable letter forms and you can do comparison uh, to see where things match and eventually over time you can piece together the words letter by letter. That is much more time consuming. Um, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> some languages have also changed, yeah. And, and yeah, we've had some, um, some terminology in these letters that if the letter forms had not been so precise and easy to read, I would have had no idea because they were words I had never heard. And actually, 
uh, looked up. One of them was um, Willem, W-H-I-L-O-M, which was a word I was not familiar with, and the dictionary noted was an archaic term. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it makes sense, we see. It's just um, a lot of times, especially with older, older script um, that might use out-of-date terminology, it's, it, you can try and do it uh, as somebody who learned a language as a second language, but somebody who is a native speaker and was educated in the education system of the country that that language is from is probably going to have uh, an easier time reading an old letter. So, all right, I'm gonna read this one real quick. Oh, that's really cool. You were able to look up where his unit was in history. That's, yeah, that's really cool. All right, so a, a description of a Virginia Christmas. Uh, Portico, I will hydrate in just a second. Um, and uh, for anybody new, I, I am live on two different channels, so I'm watching two different chats. <laughs> so if I'm responding to people and you're not seeing them chatting in the channel that you're on, they're probably in the other channel. <clears throat> my dearest G, last Christmas morn, ere I had quit my bed, a little black person came to me. A Christmas gift, she said. <clears throat> a little present give to me, a common practice here. Uh, for whites and black people all claim on Christmas and new uh, all to claim on Christmas and New Year. I gave her one sh I gave her one. She built my fire. I dressed one in a trice. Uh, I dressed no. I gave her one. She built my fire. I dressed me in a trice, resolving of the rest to claim a present very nice. But while rejoicing at the thought of catching the unwary, another black person came upstairs. A Christmas gift, Miss Mary. Indeed, I was surprised to see her come and bring me water. The one that makes only fire is the one that always otter. I choked my rage and hastened down with full determination to claim all persons, white or black, that lived on the plantation. So I'm not really fond of where this is going, and I'm probably going to stop. I don't, I've not read it before. This is one of the things we've encountered before, and this is a rather lengthy poem, and already the attitude it's putting forward, um, the, the black people in it are clearly enslaved persons, um, and we have plenty of other stuff to look at. I think I'm going to put this one down there. Uh, <laughs> And, and not go further with the poem. If, if people are curious about the poem, you can feel free to contact Special Collections at Virginia Tech, and we can get you the full text of the poem. Uh, but I'm, I'm not going to read more of it on stream. Um, the date on it... Uh, I don't see a date specifically. Um, oh, it is June 31st, 1852. And it appears to be from Joshua's sister. Um, but I will note, uh, so this was written by someone in the union. This was not it is, it is describing, it, like the title of the poem was A Virginia Christmas, um, <clears throat> but Joshua Gilman's family was from Massachusetts. So this is not a Confederate family. This is not a Southern family. This was people in the North that were using that term, terminology. Um, gonna take a, a sip of water. Thanks to uh, Lord Portico reminding me to hydrate.
Oh yeah, um, and and the poem, as far as like the study of American poetry, uh, which we do have, um, it's not an active collecting area, but we have an, uh, a British and American literature collection as well um, that used to be a, a major collection. So this this collection <clears throat> was likely acquired partly for the American Civil War connection, but it that was not the first poem we've encountered either, and so. Uh, from an American literature perspective, from looking at American poetry um, and, and the poetry forms, uh, there is some educational value there. Um, it's just not content that I necessarily want to feature on the Twitch channel and then uh, for an unknown period of time on the, the video on demand uh, once it travels over to YouTube. Um, so I'd rather not just include the entire poem um, after like the third or fourth mention and the um, going to find the enslaved persons in anger, I decided to stop. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, we've got Hawk's letters, October through December 1862. So we are past the antebellum peri period into um, the American Civil War now. And I think some of these I actually have uh, typed transcriptions, which will mean they're even easier for me to read. Um, I don't know that I have it for all of them, but we'll see. Uh, let's see, October 1st, 1862? This is not one of the ones with the transcription, so we'll just read it. And so, as was fairly typical, um, so during the American Civil War, soldiers used what paper they could get. Um, and so, there's a variety of paper shapes and sizes and colors, and um, we have letters that are cross-hatched where they wrote horizontally, then turned the paper 90 degrees and wrote and filled the page twice. Uh, so you've got text going, when you look at it, it looks like there's text going, text going both horizontally and vertically. Um, and then we even have ones where there's a third layer where they turn it again and write diagonally across the existing letters. Um, uh, some to the point where the text is just so dense it's impossible to really make out. Um, I had one where the, um, the paper itself was about the width of a roll of toilet paper or, or loo roll, depending on where you are in the world, uh, but that width, uh, and it was 16 inches tall. Um, and I don't know where this paper came from, why there was this long, uh, thin piece of paper, um, but that one's scanned and on our, our uh, website. It was very interesting to, to try and scan it. Um. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's absolutely true. Uh, we see a, a lot of um, American schools don't teach about what was going on in other countries during American events. So anyway, um, what I was, where I was going with talking about the paper shapes is, this is the envelope. It's just another piece of paper that was then uh, like the letter itself was folded up. Um, this one's in fairly decent condition, so I can kind of show you. Um, we can still see how it was folded. Um, and then this was folded around it. Uh, so this is, it, the envelope itself is just a wrap of the same paper around the folded letter. Um, 
this is noted as copy one in the same handwriting. Uh, so these are letters written by Joshua Gilman. Um, and I know from the transcription we've got like letter number two, letter number four. This is copy number one. I don't know if he wrote out multiple copies of the letters and sent them. I, I, I'm not certain, I don't know that I would be surprised by that, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, so copy number one, Mrs. R.B. Cox from J.G. Hawks, uh, October 1st, 1862, Camp Miller, Greenfield, Massachusetts. It's possible, yes, that is also possible that he kept a copy for himself, but that requires a lot of extra work because they didn't have um, access to, to things like carbon paper or an easy means of copying it other than just to write a second copy. Um, so uh, somewhat unique. I'm going to autofocus again here in a second after I finish zooming in. Uh, I know it is a little bit blurry at the moment. All right. Camp Miller Greenfield, October 1st, 1862. It might be October 7th. Um, it's really hard to tell. There's a little swoop at the top. I'm not certain if it's the 1st or the 7th. We do have a, um, a coat of arms as the embossing on this letter. Dear sister, here I am after the manner of that historic individual mentioned in Mother Goose's poems, uh, Marjorie Daw, who sold her bed and lay in straw. Uh, took the above horizontal position one week ago today, just before the storm commenced. Had some dewy hours, but took no cold in fact. Had a slight frigidity before I came uh, which has also disappeared. So if you wish to cure a cold, just take up tent life when a storm is coming on. Um, just as a disclaimer, once again, as we have noted multiple times over the course of the streaming series, don't accept medical advice from old documents in an archives. Talk to your doctor if you want to treat a cold. <laughs> um... I think so. Uh, I do think the embossing was is similar to um, what we would expect for like wax seals on letters uh, in periods prior to this. Um, that is something I am not certain of. This is not my time period. I don't. I'm, I'm not a scholar of the mid 1800s. Um, as I noted earlier in the stream, most of my expertise is with the. Um, uh, the various civil rights movements that started in America from the 1960s onward. Um, so, uh, but for this show, I look at whatever we happen to have in our collections, um, which means I'm often out of my depth. I'm often w looking at materials that I'm seeing for the first time and are not in a subject area that I study. Um, so, I, I don't know. If anybody does know um, what the embossing on the letters was for. Is it similar to like a wax seal or something like that? I would, I would happily um, accept that information from the chat. Uh, if you are able to look it up and drop it in chat, that's wonderful. I know uh, we get some, some pretty good sleuths in the chat uh, who are able to provide that information on occasion. Um, maybe he wrote a rough draft and then, uh, then a fair copy to send. Still seems like a lot of paper, indeed. And, and in this case, he's in Massachusetts, so he probably had more ready access to paper. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. He, he is quite an interesting author as far as like the, the way his sentences are formed and things like that. Um, like, he writes really well. Oh, was if it was made the same way. Um, so a wax stamp, uh, wax seals, you have um, these little bits of wax 
they're like little beads or pellets of, of wax. Uh, and you have a little spoon and you put the, the wax beads into the spoon and that way um, you can get like marbled colors and things like that and people did, it had signature colors that they would use. Um, and you take that spoon and you heat it, or sometimes you have like a pen of wax too and that that's a little harder, you'll have to shave off bits to put into the spoon. But you have a little spoon, you heat it over a candle flame um, and it melts the wax and you let it you don't have to wait very long, you wait like a second or so, so it starts to congeal up again because you don't want it fully liquid because then it'll just run all over the place. Um, and then you pour the wax onto the document that you're gonna seal, and it, uh, the wax is rapidly cooling, but it's still malleable. And then you have like, um, you have a stamp. Uh, sometimes it would be on a ring, oftentimes it was just on a handle, it's a, a metal stamp. Um, and then you press that metal stamp into the wax to create a specific impression. Um, and that also presses the wax down so that it bonds more securely with the paper. Um, and then you, when somebody receives it, um, there's a good chance that they'll know whether the letter has been opened because there's no way to reseal it um, and have the wax rebond to the paper. Uh, with the same symbol on it without forging the stamp itself. So um, that's how a wax seal works. An embossment like this would have been done with um, like an embossing press. Uh, probably um, a device that my modern brain goes to like a hole punch, like a handheld hole punch that you punch one hole at a time, where you've got like two handles with um, metal plates and uh, you would put that over top of, of the page and then press the handles together because to emboss it you have to have a backing and then the, um, the engraved stamp itself and then you're pushing the engraved stamp against the backing with the paper between it, and that's how you get the, the embossing on the page. And that's, that's still how we do like seals on important documents today. If you look at somebody's um, uh, diploma from university, if it's got a seal on it, oftentimes it is an embossed seal where it is pressed into the page to actually alter the, the shape of the page. Um, you know, like a seal that you would get on like an elementary school document is gonna be a, a, a gold star sticker or something like that. Um, but really nice documents um, still get embossing on them. And embossing itself costs a lot of money because they, um, they have to cast or carve the um, image itself that is then going to be pressed. So if you're doing like uh, letterpress or something like that uh, for embossing, it's a really expensive process. Um, and uh, the, the actual stamps that are used for embossing um, have various anti-forging features built into them. Uh, so they can be really intricate designs that have um, elements similar to like what you would expect on currency where they could have microtext or other things like that in order to prevent forging them because they are intended as a seal to, uh, to help to verify the validity of a document. <laughs> uh, let's see. So, oh, we got to the, um, <laughs> the advice that you should sleep in a tent before a storm if you're starting to feel a cold coming on. Um, disclaimer, don't accept medical advice from this stream. Uh, have 10 companies here with about 900 men, the material for a splendid regiment. As yet, we have not been mustered into the United States service, but are expecting to be soon. Uh, we have the Fremont tents, which contain each 20 men, five tents to a company, each company...
each company occupying a street. I think affairs are conducted here more systematically than they were at Camp Stanton. Companies march up to the kitchens for meals, have good food and enough good tent companions, and am more pleased than I expected to be. Of course, it would be foolish to pass an opinion upon camp life so soon. Received a letter from John recently making inquiries concerning the appointment of Quartermaster Sergeant. Uh, do you want him to go? Uh, when I came up to Conway, I found in the cars on the Western Railroad a Miss Clark to whom I was introduced in Springfield Center by Miss Hughes. Uh, she came from California with Miss H to attend school and was then on her way to school in Connecticut. Had a pleasant ride to Springfield. Uh, here I found classmate L.R. Smith on his way up the river home. He reported seeing classmate Hall in the Springfield Depot on his marriage trip. I did not see him. <laughs> Word of advice from experience, don't pitch your tent on a hill during a storm either. Uh, you did that for basic training and the rainwater just constantly ran down under the tent. Oh, oh yeah, that would be a cold night. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Mr. Clark broke his arm while I was in Conway, but it is now re recovering. Saw Charles Hawks on the campground recently. He asked me to visit him, but I declined, saying that I disliked leaving at all. He told me he should bring he should bring me some edibles from his table. These I declined, saying I wished to adopt soldiers' fare at once, adding that fruit will be acceptable, which he will bring. Um, just for those who uh, are more familiar with modern terminology, edibles in this case is not um, items containing marijuana. Um, it just means things that can be eaten. <clears throat> I think I shall call there, however. Uh, the Conway boys have niceties brought in, all of which I have shared. Have two bushel of apples in the tent now. They must have butter, which and cheese I care little about. brought in one day's rations, and when I opened the valise, a wedge of fragrant cheese was found sitting on a nice mince pie. Uh, was not this a dainty dish to set before a king? In quotation marks. Not that kind of edibles, Key Squared, you are right. Um, Mrs. Clapp did not find it in, uh, but a neighbor, oh wait, Mrs. Clapp did not put it in, but a neighbor, mother to Captain Patrick, who put in, who put in one mess enough for us both. <clears throat> <clears throat> While in Conway, I procured some gray flannels and the sewing circle made it into shirts. Uh, the sewing circle also gave two towels and a handkerchief to each volunteer. I also have a flannel band to wear around my body, uh, covering the abdomen. I need not describe camp life, for you have seen enough to satisfy yourself. Max Adams is dead. He died of fever in Iowa a year and a half ago, or, or two years ago. He was inclined to fever, he used to tell me had had typhus fever two or three times before. Today had a present from a Conway lady consisting of a soldier's needle book. Tis very large, has a needle book and several pockets. The outside is imitation Morocco and it is lined with oiled silk. <clears throat> when reading letters this way, you try to visualize the experience. 
Um, I, I like the narrative. It gives me a lot of information. Um, I personally can't picture things in my head. Um, so I rely on the text and I can conceptualize, uh, like I can think about what it might be like, but um, I am envious that you are able to picture things. <laughs> uh, have no band of music, nothing but fifes and drums, but the singing of the men takes the place of band for evening music. There is singing in all the tents near here. Our captain is a fine disciplinarian, admired by all his men except the shirks. This is written with 20 men in the tent and in the midst of singing on all sides. Hence, you need not expect anything very brilliant. Uh, but when I write you again, I hope to be so accustomed to the noise as not to be off, as not to be affected by it. We'll write now frequently and tell whatever is interesting. The proclamation of the president is at last out just as soon as he could uh, just as soon as he could issue it i am thankful for it it just suits me uh that is meaning the emancipation proclamation from abraham lincoln uh direct to camp miller company d right soon all of you yours respectfully gilman I find it really interesting um, we, we call it the Joshua Gilman Hawks papers. Uh, many times it's J.G. Hawks. We've seen Joshua G. Hawks mentioned, but he signs his own letters Gilman. Um, so that's a nice little letter uh, home to, I believe, possibly one of his sisters. Um, Mrs. Mrs. R.B. Cox is who that one was too. Interesting, no names mentioned, like the captain's name. I mean, there were names, um, but only like Mr. Mr. Clapp broke his arm, um, <clears throat> things like that, where he referred to people by last name, mostly. Um, and the only, yeah, you're right, the, I think the only soldier, the only one that I'm sure is a soldier is um, the captain. The others could have just been people in town. Uh, it's difficult to tell. <clears throat> Let's see, we are at 348. So I'm going to move us forward in time because uh, we only have about 40 more minutes and there are many more years to cover. Uh, let's see, January through February 1863. And just for speed purposes, I'm going to pick ones that have been transcribed so that I can read them faster. Um, I have a transcription of number seven. <clears throat> number seven. January 19th, number seven. About Reverend J.K. Hosmer, Baton Rouge, from J.G. Hawks, addressed to Miss Mary B. Hawks, South Reading, Massachusetts. Uh, did the... Oh, wow. Sorry, I, I got distracted. One of the pages where I can see what you all see was completely frozen. So I was just checking to make sure that everything was still going okay. I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit so that you get the full width of the page. Um, right, so this is number seven, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, January 19th, 1862. Dear all of you, your soldier boy sleeps on white sheets and this not through honorable wound, but through dishonorable disease. I will tell you about it briefly. 
One week ago today, Monday, I had an attack of colic pretty severe. One of our company lutes said, said, come Hawks, take my bunk till you are better. Tis easier than your tent floor and my room more comfortable than your tent. I accepted. <clears throat> Next day, another sergeant was taken sick, threatened with a fever. The other lute in invited him to take his bunk. So we are side beside, and we did and we did aunt get out immediately. The lutes very kindly left the room to prevent their noise doing harm. They had slept on the floor in the meantime. This other sergeant, Hosmer, has a brother in our tent, Reverend J.K. Hosmer. He immediately applied to the colonel to be specially detailed to take care of these two sick men. Yeah. So it it is number seven, but I wasn't sure before um, if it was a one, but it it is a seven apparently. <clears throat> he is a corporal of the color guard, but little to uh, little to do, so we have a capital nurse. I can't be thankful enough that my sickness fell in this wise. Quote, he shall bear them up on the wings as an eagle. They shall run and not weary. They shall walk and not faint, unquote. After recovering from the colic attack, I was threatened with fever. I remember now that I had the same symptoms quite a number of days before. The surgeon thought they indicated intermittent fever and has, I think, cured... me or so nearly. I am very much better as this letter written while sitting up in bed indicates. I have no fever now and feel sure I shall return to duty this week. For eating, I have beef tea, rice gruel, and farina gruel. All good. Mr. Hosmer has a nice bottle of wine which a friend handed to Dr. Sawyer to bring out in his hospital stores. This we shall taste of when a little stronger. Uh, will close soon, have written not knowing the extravagant rumors, or not knowing what extravagant rumors might come to you as the reg, as the reg is pretty sickly right now. Uh, reg abbreviated for regiment. Uh, yesterday's mail brought a letter from David Mick. Uh, the letter to him, which he answered, was mailed with three or four home. Why don't I answer from them? Why don't I get answer from them? The last two northern males had not a thing for me from home. Have you forgotten me? JGH. Please send a little green tea in your letter occasionally. Also send 24 cents worth of postage stamps. I have no postage bill and can't get out now to get a larger bill changed, so must try my credit with you. We'll forward in next. Stamps are mighty scarce here. G. <clears throat> Oh, and so we have the embossing here that most of his letters have. I'm gonna try an autofocus and see if you can see it. Uh, probably not the clearest. Uh, if I turn it sideways this way, it's an oval embossing. Um, it, it's a woman's head in silhouette facing to the right. Um, but it's, it's really hard to make out on camera for some of it, so I don't know, um, I will attempt to show you more of the embossing if I can find one that's more clear. Oh, this one looks more clear. Oh, no, it's a, it's not a, just a woman's head. It looks like, um, either a Roman or a Greek god. or at least that style. Uh, it's actually quite detailed in person. I'm trying, I'm trying really hard to get it so that you all can see it. Uh, autofocus?
it just looks blurry to me on on the screens I can see. But it's, sorry, it's it, it's sorry, it's really shaky. Um, but that's kind of the best that I can do because I have to hold it up to the camera, um, and there's nothing supporting it. But anyway, that is the embossing that is on most of his um, items. Let's see. I'm just gonna show this. Just lots of, lots of cursive there. This one is not, um, not transcribed and is rather lengthy, so I'm gonna skip it and move us ahead in the future again. Um, interestingly, this one has a different embossing, uh, embossed with a, a frame that says, C-H-E-A-M-E-R, Salem. Chemer Salem. But I am gonna move us into the next period of time, uh, just because we have a lot more time to cover and only about a half hour left in the stream. Um, so we'll maybe do like one letter from each folder. March 1863. A number of letters here. I have a transcription of letter number 11, so that's the one we're gonna read. Uh, this one is number nine. This one is number 10. I just, I find it very fascinating and I would be very interested to know why he numbered his letters in this way. It seems very meticulous to, to do. Um, like it's wonderful for us as, as uh, an archives or for somebody researching um, history, it just seems somewhat peculiar to, to have the author of the letters numbering their letters in this way. Uh, here we have the envelope, uh, number 11, postmarked in New Orleans in March of 1862. Uh, so the post was still working, apparently. When did... I, I don't know all of my dates for the American Civil War. Uh, just double-checking. Yeah, so the war started April 12th, 1861. So we are like a year into the war and he was, I, I just find it interesting because this would not have been just take this to the post office and send it. Um, this would have been the army on maneuvers. The army like camped down in Louisiana but they still postmarked at New Orleans. Like they still had a New Orleans postmark and stamped the letter with that. And I think that's really interesting. Possibly he wrote to multiple people and just a way to organize before sending it. Yeah, it's possible. I just, it, it's something that I find interesting and I don't think I've seen before. Um, so it's just a curiosity to me more, more than something that really needs to be dwelled upon, but um, I find it interesting. I also just find it really interesting that the Union Army had a New Orleans postmark to put on their soldiers' letters home. Um, that just, I don't know, struck me as interesting. I suppose, I don't know, if the modern army, uh, if you're deployed abroad, what does the postmark say? I never actually got mail from my brother when he was overseas. Um, we just got emails and stuff. So I don't know, would the postmark be 
the location that you're actually at, or would it be postmarked with, like the late the, like if you're somewhere in say, North Africa, would the postmark be in Germany where everything goes before it comes to the U.S.? I'm not certain. <clears throat> All right, so there's a lot of writing here. This one I do have a transcri transcription of. If it's a really good letter, we'll read the whole thing. Otherwise, we might get a little ways into it and then move forward in time. Because um, I'm curious to see some of the stuff toward the end, because um, if you check the finding aid, he was supposed to be getting a promotion to be one of the officers for the uh, United States Colored, Troop, Colored Troops Regiment, uh, which was the w regiment that had the people of color in it. Um, and he was going to be an officer for that, but he was sick, and they were on the boat heading north, and he disappeared and was never seen again. Um, <laughs> presumed to have drowned. Uh, November, or sorry, number 11. Uh, there is a note written above the date that says, I want Willie to copy the included bit of newspaper with my photograph book, also, the pencil marks and add uh, New York Independent. When at the camp, I did some company writing in the lieutenant's tent, and he boxed up my ink and pen, so I returned, the, uh, so I returned to the pencil. Baton Rouge, March 14, 62. Dear all of you, I take back all that I said in a recent letter about your laxness in writing and make most humble apology on both knees, and this is why. Day before yesterday, the mail came, and a good one it was. There is a monstrous difference between a mail which has something for me and the same article which has not. The above mentioned mail I denominated good for the reason that my name was therein on several parchments. There was M's letter of the 22nd Ultimo, number four, containing 12 pages or thereabouts of writing and an ex expressage of green tea and four postage stamps. The letter which you mentioned, the letter which you mentioned M, as having written a short time before, never came. It probably went down the Ella Worley, down in the Ella Worley. I suppose your number one was that which I received soon after landing. Number two, I received while in hospital. I suppose number three was lost and number four came in this last mail. And here we have an explanation of why he's numbering his letters. Uh, because of the chance that the letters will go missing. Uh, they're numbered so that the recipient will know if they have received them all or if a letter went missing. I wonder how common that was. <clears throat> it would more than likely be the postmark for the unit itself. to the next page. I'm actually going to zoom out so you all can see the entire page top to bottom um, because I'm probably only going to break when I hit the page breaks. Uh, and in fact, in this case, I will be reading the entirety of this before we flip the page again. So. There was a letter of 10 pages from Willie, the second I have received from her, one of nine pages and another of four pages from Conway friends. Three pages from John, these had been delayed, one paper from Sarah and two from Conway. Four letters and six papers. Uh, that mailbag had some heart to it. I'm very thankful for these long letters and also for the green tea, which I chew and swallow since I am rather inconveniently situated to steep it. I think it beneficial to health just now. After reading Mary's letter, I could see the whole home establishment, horses, cows, and all. And I could imagine how that tapioca pudding tasted. Keep some of those eggs until I come home and I will take care of them with a little of that cook's assistance. This is how I have eaten eggs here. I toast a slice of bread and break the boiled eggs on it. With pepper and salt, it is quite palatable. I did the same with a raw egg this morning. That was not bad at all. 
This noon I had a half pint of milk, which I scalded and ate with bread in it. Uh, Twas a number one. Uh, M didn't say whether Mary Nosh. Yeah, that's what it says. Uh, M didn't say whether Mary Nosh was as good company as in days of yore, but I doubt not she is. I should prefer to visit her when the judge was away. It seems to me she would appear more like Mary Upton than, uh, than them if he were present. However, she is one not be controlled by appearances very much. Where is David? Is he in SR or has he gone into the army? John Orne wrote me uh, in a little addition which he made to Willie's first letter that D was going into the army as an attache of the QM's department. Has he done so? That would be the quartermaster's department. Uh, when I finished my last, I left the regiment ready to march. There was a fair illustration of the uncertainty of what a soldier will do on the morrow. Orders were given on Monday to pack up blankets and overcoat in the knapsack and to box up all superfluous baggage and hand it to the QM. Uh, this was done, but no order to march. No drill was had from expectation of marching soon. Uh, Tuesday, orders were given to strike tents. This was done and the tents were taken back to the city and stored in one of the many U.S. arsenal buildings inside the, of the parapet. But no order to march. As a matter of course, after the tents were gone, it began to rain. No provisions had as yet been made for the sick in quarters. We're on this side now. Uh, I.e. those unwell but not sufficiently sick to go to hospital. The chaplain invited me to his tent and I passed the night there. Meantime, the shelter tents were distributed to the men for the march. We have never had them before. Don't know whether you're acquainted with this article or not. It consists simply of two roofs, separate, but made with buttons and buttonholes to fasten together at the ridge pole. Two men occupy a tent and each carries a roof on his back. Each man carries his own baggage. These tents were pitched toward night when there seemed no, prob no probability of marching. Wednesday, all was expectation, but no march. Thursday, the division marched out to a large plain and was reviewed by its general and then came back to camp. And we start on the right side here. If I can find where it goes. Well, the transcription is uh, missing something, so we'll just continue straight from the letter. Uh, the reason why no place had been formed for the sick in quarters was this, all in the hospital who were fit to be moved, but yet were not expected to be fit for duty, for some length of time were to be transported to New Orleans and then when it be taken by us who would be quickly turned out Uh, into tents if the place were wanted for wounded. There had not been... <clears throat> These had not been moved on Tuesday, but were the next day, Wednesday morning, I came back to the city and took a... took a
look in the convalescent wing, and here I saw for how long, and here, nope, uh, sorry. Wednesday morning, I came back to the city and took a bunk in the convalescent wing, and here have I lain for how long, I don't know. Well, on the way back, I met a brigade of five regiments marching out for review. The 50th Massachusetts was among them. The new the the view looked finely and the bands gave beautiful music. I'm not certain about finally there. Um, I saluted the South Reading Company as it passed and received many a recognizing look. This is the bright side of war. As I went on, I met a hospital nurse, member of my company, carrying a knapsack and following, uh, following him with, uh, following him were sick men whose knapsack it was, oh, following him a sick man whose knapsack it was leaning on a cane. Ah, said the nurse, you are just the one to help this man down to the boat. I stepped up and received his arm over my shoulder and we went aboard. Here was a little darker side. No wounded. Uh, to be sure, but pale, wan faces in abundance. The sick out on the lower deck, leaning against the side of the ship. Many men continued to come. <sighs> and I have located myself on the transcription. So, no more me struggling, and I can read a little faster for you all now. Um, uh, the many more continued to come or be brought aboard for hours, and the vessel was filled. There is something beside the paleness and thinness of a sick man's countenance that strikes the beholder. Tis the sadness of it, and the beseeching look of the eye. And these, I presume, felt that they, in going from their own regimental hospitals, were going among careless strangers for nurses away from their own proper soldier home. 37 went from 52nd, a larger number probably than went from many others of the 40 or 50 regiments stationed here. Another shipload went down the day before. Nurses went with them who returned today. They report that one died on the passage down and another after their arrival, not of our regiment. They also report that the hospitals there in New Orleans were very nice indeed. Tis a consolation to know that they come that they had a comfortable place to stay after their arrival. Some regiments sent no nurses with their sick. That's a shame. When I was taken sick, you may remember that I was taken into our lieutenant's room. After recovering a little, I was transferred to another room in the same building where were only four or five sick. Now I am in the regular hospital, the lower or convalescent room of which was formerly a large saloon. <clears throat> called the Arc and Seal Saloon. There are some 40 or 50 men in it, and in all, including those down the river, we have 150 men unfit for duty. The regiment has lost many men by details for special duty. Thus, a butcher in Company D is detailed to assist in killing the fresh beef, harness makers are detailed to repair the harnesses, bakers to work in the bakeries, nurses for the hospital, etc. Almost every trade finds a place for itself in the army. Othello's occupations never gone. 
even your humble correspondent, had, had told a uh, black boy of 18, Cook's assistant, that he would teach him as long as he, your humble correspondent, was sick in quarters. Uh, said black boy had come in while I was in hospital, and when I went to camp, I heard of his desire to learn, asking the letters, etc. But he has gone with the regiment, was a bright boy, and would have learned readily, I think. A friend entered a tent of the black regiment and found a black person trying to re learn to read. You are just the man I want to see, said... Uh, said, uh, and now we're here. You are just the man I want to see, said the latter, to help me in this reading. Well, said my friend, bring me a draft of water, then I will help you, which he did. Still there is an unaccountable antipathy felt by the white toward the black soldiers. Some of our men are stationed, oh, sorry, next page. No, don't strike the beholder. That's a bad idea, Hannah. <laughs> you are indeed correct, unless you're trying to survive the encounter. <clears throat> Wait, where are we? Page nine. I need page, where am I? Did I do this wrong? Did I show, I think I showed you all the wrong pages. My apologies, we are here. Some of our men are stationed at the contraband headquarters to deal out rations, etc. Some have charge of gangs of black people while at their work of unlading government stores, carting it from the levee, working on the fortifications, etc., etc. So I don't think that over 650 marched out on Friday. Speaking of antipathies, the New York regiments show it much more than Massachusetts regiments do. New York is a dreadfully mean state, notwithstanding all the nobility which my aunt can give it by residing there. Some New York regiments have but about 500 men, and this too, when they are but just in the field, came out with us. The men skedaddled while lying in New York at every opportunity, every opportunity they could find. Officers who have no better control should be cashiered immediately. Many of these men are antediluvian heroes, I judge from their gray hair. The same remarks concerning desertion may be made of the Connecticut regiments. One came out with us, which had on its rolls in its own state about 1,000 names. Before it left New York, they left so that it landed at Baton Rouge with 509 men only. Such things make me mad, or more politely angry, such inefficiency. One regiment of a thousand men is far better than two of five hundred each. The 41st Massachusetts was encamped near us on Long Island. Uh, their men deserted so that a guard was taken from the 52nd and placed around them. Twelve men deserted from... Now we're here. Twelve men deserted from Will Smith's company alone. We have lost but one, and I am not certain we have lost even that in this way. One reason for the difference is this. Our companies were enlisted from specific, specified towns where most of the men had permanent residence. Pride would prevent desertion, also a liability to arrest. The men of the 41st and also of the New York regiments had in many cases no home. They were foreigners or co cosmopolitan. Co cosmopolites, and upon desertion, need merely take up a new name and reside so. So you see, taint all honor that makes the difference, though tis partly. But for cleanliness and neatness, the Massachusetts soldiers take pre preeminence, so far as I have seen. A foreigner, the major in some regiment here, remarked to Captain Hosford that he could always tell a Massachusetts regiment by its looks. Tis more tidy than regiments from other states. Sunday, p.m., about 12 o'clock last night, heavy cannonading was heard in the direction of Port Hudson. It continued some two hours.
Then a fire was seen, and by and by an explosion. This morning we were anxious to hear the news. Twas bad enough, the steam frigate Mississippi got, got aground, and to save it from <clears throat> the rebels, it was fired. Indeed, key squared, not that Will Smith. The rest of the news was good that three large naval vessels ran past the forts and are safe above them. This cuts Port Hudson off from assistance from upstream. Our army has, I presume, cut the railroad communications to Clinton, and so the place is, in a measure, surrounded. Tis a pity that we have so small naval force here, especially with that which is ironclad, but have one, the Essex. Those which run the gauntlet were wooden vessels. The Mississippi was an old, though staunch vessel. She had lived past her age and... The transcription here is very interesting. I need to find these words. So the transcriber wrote, uh, she had lived past her age and hor lis is of less account. Um, it's, she had lived past her age and her loss is of less account uh, than would be the loss of a small ironclad gunboat. I don't know if I have a pencil that I can make a note on the transcription right now. I do. I'm going to... Uh, just make a little note and correct this transcription. Uh, there was also a joke in there somewhere. You just couldn't quite come up with it. Yeah. Um, where are we? <coughs> well, now I lost myself. Aha. Uh -huh. There. Um, right. <laughs> this, this is all I did. The transcription here said, she had lived past her age and hor lis, H-O-R space L-I-S-S, -S, is of less account. I crossed that out and noted that it is her loss. Uh, her loss is of less account than would be the loss of a small ironclad gunboat. She carried some 24 guns, and because of this great number, was well adapted to lay off such a place as this or New Orleans to defend it, though the guns were not nearly as large as those generally in use nowadays. The loss of life we do not yet know, nor do we know what the army is doing. A colonel on Banks's staff was brought to the city last night about 11 o'clock, wounded in the leg. The telegraph wire is being put up from... from Baton Rouge to the army. That looks as if Banks was to make a permanent lodgment there and not leave on the first intimidation that, it, that he is, un, or the first intimation that he is unwelcome. The general feeling among the troops here is that he has not sufficient force to attack such a strong place. He has not taken, in my opinion, more than 25,000 men at the outside and perhaps not more than 20,000. If the rebels can make a dash upon this place in his absence, they can have much stores. Now is Banks's anxious hour. We have some troops left, of course, to guard the place. Today is very sultry, and the rain, which always follows heavy cannonading, has fallen, its, fallen in showers. I have never seen that philosophically explained that I remember. Apparently, after the cannons fire a lot, it rains and he's pondering as to why that might be. <clears throat> Captain Bunker's company is the 41st. Tis company K have not yet seen Hutchings. Saw Charles Smith on the levee recently. Hardly knew him. He, was, he has had the fever and is very thin, coughs nights and has diarrhea. Will apply for discharge. Not one in my company who had had the fever has yet returned to duty. And many who have the measles stay in hospital four or five weeks. 
Lastly, as to myself, I still have some diarrhea. I procured two small bottles of Mrs. E. Kidder's diarrhea cordial. Mother thought very highly of it, and it has done me much good. We've, we've actually covered um, patent medicines uh, on previous streams. Uh, and this, that would definitely have qualified as one. Um, wish I had another, but tis, tis not to be had in the city. The surgeon had given me medicine previously, which helped me for the time, but not permanently. Blessed is the man who is never reminded, save by hunger, that he has a stomach or abdomen. I shall not do duty until I and the surgeon also count myself fit for it. Quiet, I find to be the best medicine, united with a very simple diet. Hope the paymaster will soon come along if I have got to be sick much longer. It was hard to see the soldiers pack up to march and not go with them. It required, moreover, considerable moral courage not to try to go with them, but it would have been to no avail, or of no avail. I am glad M made mention of her weakness, shall take courage. This letter is very long and I will stop. Write very soon, do. Uh, tell George to get a little pamphlet and, entitled How a Free People Conduct a Long War and Read It. Tis very interesting and encouraging. Very affectionately, J.G.H. And close a bit from the State House of Louisiana Burnt last January. <laughs> Correcting transcripts? What are you, some kind of archivist on an adventure? I mean, yeah. All right, we, that, that was a lengthy letter that uh, we have gotten through. Um, I'm going to do one more letter and then we're gonna stop because we are at time, but I do wanna take a look in the very last folder and the very last letters and just see if there's anything from, you know, right before he disappeared. Just posthumous letters and tributes, that's not what we want. Um. <clears throat> but as you can see, we've got letters from the time that he was actually ill. It seems like he was ill quite a lot towards the end of the war here. I'm gonna see what we got. I have letter number 18. But it is not the last one. So I'm, that's, that one's transcribed, but I'm gonna do this short one that appears to be possibly the last one in here. Port Hudson, July 9th, 1863. Dear friends at home, before this reaches you, I presume you will hear that this stronghold is ours, following quickly on the footsteps of Vicksburg. I write just to say that I am safe, though very much worn down. Weight 116 pounds. New England air and water and food will revive me, I calculate, in about one week after my arrival there. Surely victory is not all in the side, on the side of the Rebs. She has favored the glorious cause some. This campaign of banks has closed gloriously, but I will not write more. If I do, I shall have nothing to tell when I come. Home sweet home. Those words are very tame to express my feelings toward it. Bless you all. Shall march in tomorrow and probably for home just as soon as an arrangement can be made. Whether we shall come by up river, or uh, of which there is some talk, or by sea, I do not know. Thy very affectionate brother, Gilman. So that is the final letter that we have in here. And as we know uh, from the history of this soldier, um, they did get on a boat, and they were headed home. <clears throat> they were still ill, and one day they were on the boat, and the next day they weren't, and they were presumed to have drowned, uh, but nobody beyond that, nobody knows for certain what happened to him. Um, I think these letters have been, sorry, uh, 
I thought the letters were really interesting today. Um, thankfully, mostly legible. Uh, had some transcriptions to look at them. Um, I, I thank you all for coming to join me uh, to, to look at this collection today. Um, there is Let's see, what we're doing next week. Uh, there was a request uh, last week or the week before. Somebody was curious about what we might have on the Grange movement. So for next week, I am pulling everything I can find in our collections about the Grange movement. Um, and it should be enough to fill two hours. Uh, so I think it might have been Key Squared that had requested that one. Uh, but that is the plan for next week. So thank you all for joining me today for the Joshua Gilman um, Hawks papers. Um, we'll be looking at the Grange movement next week. I'm not certain what's coming up after that because I haven't decided yet, but I may do more of this, like pick a number at random and pull the collection and, and we'll see what's there. Uh, Cause that seemed to go pretty well. Um, let me go ahead and look and see who we're going to raid. Um, doo -doo 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 because we will pop over. Um, I think we are gonna head over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, which is you know, our typical raid here. It's nice to um, be able to head over to another um, sort of educational kind of chill stream after this. Uh, right now they have the kelp forest cam on. I do want to say, <laughs> as I drop things, um, as I set up this stream, I, I just want to thank everybody for joining me. Um, and I'm going to actually mention, uh, for everyone watching, um, we do have a program schedule for the uh, twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios channel. That stands for Virginia Tech University Libraries Studios. So twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios. Um, uh, coming up tomorrow at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time, we have Ethereal World Building, uh, which is a program um, that looks at 3D environment design. Uh, so if you're at all interested in that, tune in to twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios tomorrow for um, some 3D virtual environment design. On Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, we have Finale Fridays, which is a music composition stream. Um, so you can pop in on Fridays at 2 p.m. for that. And on Tuesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern, um, Maker Max's Marvelous Mockups, uh, which is um, uh, 3D print modeling uh, with Max. Uh, so uh, feel free to drop by VTUL Studios for one of those um, programs or join me next week here for um, another Archival Adventures on Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. It's been great having you all, and I look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>